Nahum. We don't know much about Nahum. What we do know is uh, is that it's a weird, uh, unusual name. And uh, hold on, I'm trying to. There we go. Like you don't hear very many people call their their son Nahum. You know, like I hear you got a lot of biblical names out there: Joshua, Paul, Ezekiel, Matthew. You got those. I've even heard more fewer cases, even like my name's Cyrus. I mean, you guys are used to it because you got me, you got my son, you got my dad. We even had the sheets when they're coming, Cyrus sheets. So at one point, my dad, he came a couple times in a row, I remember, and there was four Cyruses in the building, which is crazy in a group of 100, 200 people to have four Cyruses. That's unique. Um, but I've also heard like names like Obadiah, you know, uh, but I've never heard a Nahum. And, uh, and there, there might be a reason, because uh, this isn't like a, like a message that you want to hear, you want to read about all the time. Uh, this, is a, this is a harsher message, and Nahum knows it. All right, so we are going to be Nahum chapter 1. The burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. I'm in New King James Version, just so you guys are aware. And uh, uh, some of the things that we do know about Nahum is that he's an Elkoshite. Uh, we're not for sure exactly where that is. We be- a lot of scholars believe it's somewhere near Galilee. Uh, part of that is because Capernaum, is what we say in English, is actually uh, not pronounced Capernaum in the Hebrew, it's Kafar Nahum, which means Nahum's village. And, uh, and so, so just so you guys are aware, so that's why they kind of think it's in uh, Galilee. They, and like, they don't even know how old this guy was. They don't know tons about him, uh, except this a little bit. And, uh, uh, but what we do know about his timing is that he would have been uh, somewhere in the ages of like 663 to 612. Uh, Nineveh fell in 612, and this was roughly uh, uh, about 100 to 150 years after Jonah prophesied to Nineveh. So, so Nahum is going to be prophesying uh, really destruction uh, upon Nineveh tonight. So Jonah, which Brian is going to be teaching on later, Brian White, uh, he will teach through Jonah, and everyone repents. He gets the he gets the sweet story, you know. People repent, and it's exciting, and uh, and I get the one that's like, man, no one, no one's repenting. Everyone's just getting judged, and uh, but this happens, and what it does show us is that God loves us, and we gotta always look at that, you know. I remember as a Bible college student, it was uh, my third semester, and uh, and I, so I'd been. I would have been, gave my life uh, two or three years before this. And I remember struggling with this question. Like, like people would ask me, is like, if God is so good, then how can destruction happen? You know, and I looked at, like, people were always saying, like, Sodom and Gomorrah is like the worst destruction that's recorded in the Bible. And so I looked at it, and I studied it, and I saw grace. You know, like, God shows a lot of grace, even in times. You know, like one grace here, one picture of grace here is with Nineveh, 100 to 150 years after Jonah preaches to him, they repent, they're back to their ways, but it's 100, 150 years, somewhere in that range. God has been patient, you know, and he was patient with them before. So it's not like this is the, the first time that this has happened, all right? Uh, one other thing, uh, hold on, I'm trying to turn off the sound so you don't hear dings as my wife gets text messages because this is connected to her phone and she's a very popular lady, unlike me, and people love her. So they text her and and that's sweet. I love her. And so, but before, um, I kind of got off track after that, I'm sorry. But, uh, but Nahum, actually his name means comfort. And, uh, and you think about it as like, man, that's not, that's not a name 
that you would think a prophet who is getting ready to prophesy destruction on a place like his name would be. Because a lot of times it, it seems like those Old Testament names was going to be, be like what they did. And, uh, and, but Nahum, it, he, he definitely hit destruction in Nineveh's court. At the same time, he was hitting comfort in Judah's court. Because Nineveh or Assyria, all right, that's uh, Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. They uh, were uh, essentially kind of being that that tormentor to Judah at this time, and so Judah uh, was protected by protected uh, by God, and uh, and they weren't officially oppressed and taken over like the Northern Kingdom, but they were getting pounced on. And uh, it's kind of like the friendly fire or whatever, you know, just like, hey, here's a warning shot. Remember, we're here. We can destroy you at any time, you know. Uh, and so uh, that's that's what it's kind of like. And uh, and so for that country, it would be comforting for Judah. It would be very comforting to know that destruction is coming for them. It's as if uh, someone prophesied and knowing this is a guy that was a prophet today and said, Russia will be destroyed, and this way, this way, this way, and Ukraine would be like rejoicing. You know, they would be so excited, right? Uh, and so it's a similar thing if that would happen today. Uh, but we, uh, we also will see that uh, God is going to, uh, three things really, is that God is a jealous God in chapter 1, and that Nineveh will fall. Chapter 2, God is a righteous judge, and, uh, and how Nineveh will fall. And chapter 3 is, uh, God is just, and why Nineveh will fall. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I hope that we will never be like Nineveh, where we, where we repent and we give our lives to the Lord, but then run right back uh, and stay there. You know, there's one thing going back and sinning, there's another thing going back and staying there. When you when you go back and you repent and come back to the Lord, hallelujah. You know, we all screw up. You know, it's something I teach myself, I teach my kids, because constantly we screw up. But to stay in that mess up is a different story. And so we need to always come back to the Lord. And He is so gracious and so patient to let us come back. He is a gentle shepherd. So verse 1 again, the burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of, the, of Nahum the Elkoshite, the burden against, it was something that he carried. You know, he felt the weight of it. He saw it. It wasn't, it wasn't just like, a, like he just started writing, but it was some sort of a vision. You know, and, and Isaiah even talks about having a vision like something like this, where it's things get destroyed. And, uh, and could you imagine, though, like watching, and as we'll read this, the vision that he's going to have and how hard it would be to carry that message to someone, even if they're your enemy. You know, we are supposed to pray for our enemies. We're supposed to love our enemies. And, that's, and it's hard to do. But when it comes down to it, like it is also hard to tell your enemies that God's going to destroy you. Because this is what we know as believers is that, that if they have not repented, they will go to hell. And, uh, uh, and that is a hard thing. Verse 2. God is jealous and the Lord avenges avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry, and dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountain quakes before him, the hills melt, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. 
Who can stand before his indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows who trusts in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue his enemies. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time, for while tangled like thorns and while drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble fully dried. From you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they are safe and likewise many, yet in this manner they will be cut down. When he passes through, though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. For now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer out of the house of your gods. I will cut off the carved image and molded image. I will dig your grave. For you are vile. Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feast, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. All right, God is jealous. And and we all know this. But just again, just to remind us is that like this isn't the jealous like when we when our neighbor gets that Corvette. Or when you're a Colts fan and the Patriots win win again, you know this is, this jealous is more like God loves you so much that He is upset and and He wants you to be with Him because He knows that life is right there. He knows that what you're walking into is your, is death. Just as the Proverbs describes, there is a young naive man stumbling in the streets and he gets caught up by the harlot. And uh, and his destruction. You know, God doesn't want us stumbling. Just as he described here is like uh, down later in the verses, verse 10, it says, For while tangled like thorns, while a drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stumble fully dry, stubble fully dried. You know, you, you're tangled up in those thorns and uh, and you're drunk. There's no way you're getting out. If, if you do, you're going to come out and you're going to be all ripped apart. And, uh, but then it says, not only are you like that, but you're, but you're so dry that, that immediately there's just that little flame and it catches. You know, we use uh, dryer lint to catch our fires in our fireplace on the campsite. We were just in Washington, upstate Washington. Used We took a... Uh, a baggie of lint, you know, and uh, because it catches just like that. And uh, and that's what he's talking about. It's like, you're going to get destroyed. You're going to burn up and no more. There's no more lint. We used it all. It was all gone in that bag. And uh, uh, because it's so easy to catch fire. And that's, that's what it's talking about. It's like, you have been turning away from me so much that you're going to be, there's going to be no more of you. I'm wiping you, everything about you out. They're caught in the thorns. They're drunk. They're not escaping. And then they're going to get burnt. Imagine being Nahum seeing this as a vision. Like that's what he is seeing. But we go back to to this. is verse 2 again. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. Remember these things. It's like whatever attributes or uh, characteristics are attributed to God, it's in a good light. It's never in a, in a negative light. So we even think furious. Well, a lot of times we think fast and furious, the movies. Some of them are good. Some of them are horrible. All right. Uh, but then we also think, man, I'm furious right now because so-and-so did this to me. So-and-so just cut me off. So-and-so said they do this and they didn't do this and now I'm I'm mad. You know, I've been there. I've I've been there plenty of times. And uh and my wife can attest. Uh 
But that's not the fury that God is. He's, it's not a bad fury like what I get. It is a fury that he is so upset that you are worshiping something so much different, so much death. Verse 9. What do you conspire against the Lord? He'll make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. And, uh, and I think about this. It's like how often do we try to plant, like, or not plant, but plan things against the Lord? You know, like, like God is doing this, and then we're like, ah, oh, this is going to be better. Uh, and so it's not even, not even that. Like they are actually planning against him. So they're like, God, I see. Like, because I mean, think about it. this was Nineveh 100 years ago. They repented and gave their lives to the Lord. And they said, we see that. I got you. But I'm going to go, I'm going to make these plans and go this way. Because I don't want what you have. I want to make these plans and go against you. And I want to do these things. And we're going to learn a little bit more about their kings uh, on chapter 2 on some of the quotes that uh, a guy named David Guzik had. Uh, I'm not that smart to come up with the quotes, that, but he is. He's a genius. You can get on Blue Letter Bible, read all his commentaries, and, uh, and then you'll realize, like, man, Cyrus has no clue what he's talking about, but David Guzik does. All right? Um, but... Verse, verse 14 says, The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer out of the house of your gods. I will cut off the carved images and the molded image. I will dig your grave, for you are vile. This is God saying it to them, that I'm going to dig your grave. This is how much you displease me. This is how much you are against me, that I'm going to dig your grave. And... Uh, Man, like imagine that, hearing that from someone saying, like coming up to you and say, hey, God is so displeased with what you're doing that he is going to dig your grave. But this is the sweet thing for us, is that, is that our grave was dug, but Jesus went there and died for us in that grave. You know, and how much does he love us? You know, he, he is so kind, so precious. But he took everything upon himself so that I and you did not have to go to hell, that I and you did not have to face his fury in the judgment, that I and you, uh, we don't have to say God is like jealous and wanting to come after us anymore, that we get to say God is jealous and he has me because of what he did in the grave. Not because of what I did, but because of what he did. And, uh, and so praise him in that way. You know, it's like whatever is going on in your life, praise him in that you don't have to face that grave that was dug for you. That you get to live in freedom. And know that it was already covered up. That you get to walk on that grave. And you get to walk freely. Chapter 2. He who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily, for the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the empty, emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of preparation, and the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. 
They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make haste to her walls, and the defense is prepared. The gates of the rivers are opened, and the palace is dissolved. It is, de- it is decreed. She shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up. And her maid servants shall lead her as with the voice of doves, beating their breasts. Though Nineveh of old was like a pool of water, now they flee away. Halt! Halt! they cry. But no one turns back. Take spoil of silver. Take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable uh, prize. She is empty, desolate, and waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side. And all their faces are drained of color. Where is the dwelling of the lions? And the feeding places of the young lions? Where the lion walked, the lioness and the lion's cub, and no one made them afraid. The lion tore in pieces enough for his cubs, killed for his lioness, filled his caves with prey, and his dens with flesh. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots and smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. So as I was saying earlier, in 612, Nineveh gets destroyed. They get destroyed by the Medes and the Babylonians teaming up and destroying it. And uh, uh, that's two big places destroying one other big place. And uh, uh, that's what happens. It gets destroyed. And there's not much else to say in that except a few things that I have here. uh, That she shall be led away captive. Nineveh will fall uh, before the mighty army, and they'll be led away just as the Assyrians would lead nations away into captivity. And so they're basically what they did happened to them. They'd lead them away in captivity, and they'd be led. And, uh, and I couldn't imagine being led away in captivity. I'd, sometimes I try to think about these things like, no, what would I do? In certain cases, you know, like when Jesus uh, walks on water, like what would I do? Like that one's a little bit easier. Like I would be like rejoicing. Uh, Being led away in captivity, I don't really want to think about that one. Uh, I hope I don't have to experience that one. Uh, And it's a little bit harder for me to think about. But I imagine it to be very painful. My mouth and my lips like all chapped up and uh, and I'm stumbling uh, because a lot of times, when I'm on a long walk, I usually have a kid strapped to me, like um, Bo. And so I think about like, it's like, man, would I be able to carry Bo in that time? Probably not, right? I'm probably already worn out from war, uh, just lost the war. So, so not only uh, are you uh, being led away, but you just lost. So you, you, you have like everything away from you is destroyed. You know, more than likely you're being led away, your home was destroyed. You know, there's a good chance that people that you know are dead. You know, you think about all these, start thinking about all these things, and it is a vicious thing. Uh, Ukraine is facing some of these things right now. When we went over, when I went into Ukraine, like there's people that they know that their relatives, their friends have passed away through this tragic war. And so be praying for the Ukrainians. Be praying for the Russians. Be praying for the people that are commanders. You know, we get to intercede because of what Jesus done. And uh, and it is very important to do that. And so be praying for them and encouragement for those people. This is a different story, though, is that uh, Nineveh is is really kind of an old adage is they're reaping what they sow. And so they do that. Uh, and then also, I wanted just to mention there, it was like Nineveh of old was like a pool of water. Saying they were an old pool, like they were a pool of water. 
You know, people will probably go and drink out of it. Cow, they take their, their sheep there, their cows there to drink out of it. But it's all dried up now. You know, have you ever been to a place where it once was water and then it's no more? They got, they got boats that are just stuck in the mud. And sometimes they're like sticking kind of up at an angle. And there's no way to get them out. I mean, you'd have to dig and dig and dig. You can't just like yank it out by a tow truck or anything. But that's what happens sometimes. And they are all dried up. There's nothing left of them. And this is how much God is going to destroy them. And then in the end of this chapter, it also talks a lot about the lions. You probably caught on to that. Uh, you guys are all pretty smart here, the ones I know at least. In uh, um, verse 11, it kind of starts there, where is the dwelling of the lions? And it's kind of like, well, what does that mean? Well, lions was, a lion was like their symbol. You know, we're, ours is the bald eagle, uh, we're freedom, and we fly, right? But theirs is the lion. They roar, they're loud, they're proudful, and they're getting taken down. And that's what's going to happen. All right? And then one other thing from chapter 2 is, uh, is that, that also they, uh, verse 12, 13, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the, short, the sword shall devour your young lions, and I will cut off prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. And so saying that, it was like, like they were cutting out everybody. But there are people who were saying that they were prophesying for these false gods that they worshipped were also, they're getting cut out. And a lot of times that's what we need to pray for is not that they would die, those, those people that are saying, like leading people away, but that those people, uh, that, they're, that, that what they say would fall onto deaf ears. Or that what they would say, they can't even think about it. You know, this is something that we get to pray for. Is that those false messengers would not have a message anymore. That those false messengers would not be able to expound on their message anymore. You know, you go to, you go to certain festivals and, uh, and markets and you'll see uh, certain uh, cult groups set up down there sharing their message. You can talk to them, it's fine, if God's leading you that way. But you can also just pray that no one would talk to them. And that that message would not fall into uh, someone's hands that's looking for some truth. That's looking for a savior. That's looking for redemption. That's looking for a purpose in life. You know, uh, that, that those uh, message, messengers would start to realize the real truth. There is a book called Forgiving Forward. I haven't read it. Um, a guy named Bill Holdridge did a book review on it, and I want to get it. Uh, but uh, it's talking about walking in forgiveness. And in this quip that he said was that, that, um, <clears throat> that you have to forgive uh, forward. Like, so you're walking in it. You're just not walking in, like, you don't just forgive as someone does you wrong, but even before the person give, does wrong, that they, that you're walking in that forgiveness. Like, so, so if someone comes up and punches you, you're already forgiven them, which is a difficult thing, really difficult. But at the end of this, I'll show you a little bit about Jesus and how he did it. It'll be the last thing that I read to you. But, uh, but, with all those those mess, cult messengers, we get, we can pray that they would know what true forgiveness is, because a lot of times it's all works it's all works based, and we're the only thing that's really true forgiveness. Chapter three. Woe to the bloody city! It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs the noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels o of galloping horses of clattering chariots horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear there is a multitude of slain a great number of bodies countless corpses they stumble over the corpses because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot the mistress of sorceries who sells 
nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirt your skirts over your face i will show the nations of your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame i will cast abominable filth upon you make you vile and make you a spectacle it shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say nineveh is laid waste who will bemoan her where shall i seek comforters for you are you better than noemon that was situated by the river. Uh, that no Amon is actually part of the how people get where uh, uh, Nahum uh, prophesied, like the timing, because it, uh, it, that is the Hebrew name, uh, uh, is the Egyptian uh, city of Thebes. And Thebes was another wealthy, mighty city that was destroyed completely. The Assyrians of Nineveh knew this well because it was uh, their army that destroyed Thebes. And so they know exactly what's going on here and saying, you destroyed that, that's what's going to happen to you. And so essentially God's saying, remember what you did? Remember what you did? Back to verse 8. Are you better than Noamon that was situated by the river, that had the waters around her, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall was the sea? Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was boundless. Put uh, and Lubim were your helpers, yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed to pieces. At the head of Avery Street, they cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. You also will be drunk. You'll be hidden. You also will seek refuge from the enemy. All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they are shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Surely your, your people in your midst are women. The gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour the bars of your gates. Draw your water for the siege. Fortify your strongholds. Go into the clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will eat you up like a locust. Make yourself many like the locust. Make yourself many like the swarming locust. You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunders and flies away. Your commanders are like swarming locusts, and your generals are like great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges on a cold day. When the sun rises, they flee away, and the place where they are is not known. Your shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Your nobles rest in the dust. Your people are scattered on the mountains, and no one gathers them. Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you, for upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? Woe to the bloody city. Verse 1. It is a full of lies and robbery. Its victims never departs. You know, uh, like robbery is one of the things that as a city they keep stats of uh, throughout the nation throughout the world basically uh, and it's one of the things that they say oh this is a good city to live in this is a bad city to live in you know they keep stats of all the crime that happens and uh, uh, and robbery is one uh, especially if it enters into a house where where someone has now entered into your house and a lot of times you feel unsafe you know somehow this person entered in how did that happen why, why did it happen? Will they do it again while I'm here? Will someone else do it? What's going to happen? You know, and uh, and then it also says full of lies. Lies is a hard thing. When you start to lie, it's hard to get out of that trap. We get tangled up in it, and uh, and so uh, one thing. 
you know, I encourage, uh, and it's actually from that book, uh, Forgiving Forward, is, uh, is the part of that forgiving forward is to pray, not that that person would stop lying, but that person would know truth. And, uh, and I think that's huge. Because a lot of times we, we pray that this person would stop doing something, or, or even my kids or myself. I'd be like, man, I wish I would stop doing this, and so I pray for that. I wish I would stop uh, being so furious at times. But instead of praying that way, I need to pray, man, like, Lord, make sure I have joy. That's from you. When, when things do upset me, that I have a heart like you to forgive. And so, so in all of these things, like we can just continue to go over all of it. I mean, you got the sorcerers, you got the harlots, you got all of these people, and uh, and and not only those people, but the the generals. You know, these the people that are noble people, and God's saying they're going to get destroyed. Corpses are going to be everywhere. They're going to be on the mountains. You can do whatever you want. You can go and try to make everything that you want to make, but it's going to get destroyed. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Nineveh walked in pride. You know, that's where, like that, lion is a cool animal. I love lions. I've thought about getting a tattoo of a lion, a bloody one, on my chest. Um, uh, but it's a symbol of pride as well. And that's where this comes with Nineveh. It wasn't like it was a cool thing. And uh, but it was a symbol of pride, and that's how they were dressed. They lived in pride, and God doesn't want us to live that way. He wants us to walk humbly in Him. And then uh, Psalm seventy-three. You think back to it, uh, Asaph. He writes that psalm, and uh, and and this is a, a psalm that I read quite a bit. And uh, and if you've never read it, read it. But uh, it says this, verses 17 through 19, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places, you cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation, as in a moment they are utterly consumed with tears. All right, And so this is talking about, like, as a, as a believer sometimes, it's hard to see someone succeed and knowing, like, Man, you're doing so much wickedness. Like I think about uh, me, I I really enjoy rap, and so seeing some of those rappers get up on stage and just like they just continue to just outflow so much wickedness out of their mouth, uh, and all sorts. Because country music, let's let's be honest, it does the same thing. It's not it's not just rappers. I just I don't like country music, and so I don't talk about it. But uh, I know I know it because my mom and dad. That's all they listened to growing up. And so you got like, there's a tear in my beer because I'm longing for you, dear. And it's like, come on. Like, that's how you're going to solve your achy, breaky heart? Like, all of this, so it's not just rap, it's country. And so you got a lot of people that are like that. And, uh, um, but, uh, like, all this wickedness is overflowing them. And even people on, like, that aren't these famous celebrities that you see on Twitter and the TV and other things, but also people in our daily lives, coworkers, and like, man, how did that guy get a promotion when he is constantly lying? And uh, uh, but this is the thing: is that the Lord sees you and He knows you, and He loves you. And and so I go to this Psalm seventy three because sometimes I get so f- frustrated and uh, and I'm like, man, go, God, but you are faithful. And, uh, and, and we don't need to pray that they would be destroyed. We need to pray that they would come to know salvation. Uh, we're not here to destroy somebody. We're here to love someone uh, so that they would die to themselves. So we're loving someone to death so that they could actually know life. And, uh, and even though it is our enemy, it is the hardest person that we know, uh, that we work with, Maybe it's our neighbor and their dog takes a poop on our front porch every morning. I don't know what, who this person is, but a lot of times we all got somebody. We all have someone that is frustrating us. 
and we need to pray for them. And sometimes it's that person you see in the mirror. And we have to deal with that as well. And, uh, and know this, that God loves you. He doesn't want you to stay like the Ninevites, repent and then go back. He wants you to, to remain as a, as a repented believer who might go back, but also repents again and comes and knows Jesus' grace and his truth and his love more and more and more. And so John 8, if you guys can flip there real quick, and this will be the last thing that I read 